Okay, hello to everybody, and uh, we are here for continue our English for Environment within uh, the European project uh, Erasmus Plus uh, SPAM, uh, School Plastic Free Movement. And uh, we are here with Gordon Kennedy, and the topic today is a continuation of uh, what we've been discussing last time about uh, which are the main problems of the environment in this moment. and which is the micro language that is important to acquire in order to be able to share the future activities within the movement that we are creating. Thank you very much for your participation and I give immediately the floor to our friend Gordon Kennedy. Thank you and see you later. Okay, so uh, Okay, so good afternoon everybody. I hope uh, I hope everyone's okay. Now I'm just to check, going to start sharing. Okay, um, right. Just before, just before I start, um, uh, I'd just like to just like to say a couple of things because I realised that um, looking at my original timetable as proposed, and looking at the actual, let's say, speed at which uh, I've been doing these things. Um, I realised that we're, I'm, a, I'm a little bit behind schedule, but maybe that's okay because uh, maybe in the first place I wasn't quite sure what the schedule would be anyway because uh, it's difficult to judge the time uh, time for these things, particularly in such a let's say such a large scale um, a large scale project. So um, what uh, what we're going to do today? is we're going to finish what we started last time where we, we started to talk about uh, recycling and I'm sorry ah, to look, at my, look at the calendar and this we said was part of the um, part of the let's say the macro area of waste um, now obviously this is something which is very uh, very important in our our everyday lives um, it sort of it is something that we come into contact uh, come into contact with uh, personally. So I think it is worth spending uh, a reasonable amount of time on this. Um, however, if uh, if time permits, um, we will hopefully also be able to start towards the end of the session today. Uh, be able to start something about um, conservation, which is uh, to do with uh, to do with looking at ecosystems um, so I'm going to try I'm not going to speed up so don't worry about me going too fast um, I'm just going to take things at the, at the, the, the natural pace but um, hopefully today we will uh, recover a little bit of um, a little bit of time okay so we talked about um, the five R's of, uh, of uh, waste management. Um, so, uh, and in particular from the, the, the from the personal point of view. So, we t we talk about uh, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. But of course, we only have four here because the principal, uh, sorry, the principal. Uh, one of the first, uh, the, sorry, the principal uh, principle at the beginning is refuse to make refuse. If you remember that uh, that rather uh, strange saying, um, refuse to make ref refuse. In other words, um, to actually um, think twice or three times before engaging in activities which can uh, which can produce uh, which can produce waste so uh, we're talking about reducing reusing repurposing and recycling um, but as we will see it goes a little bit uh, it goes a little bit further okay so um, I think this was the this was the slide that we got to last time this was the picture that we got to last time um, and the idea here is to propose that uh, many objects that we throw away can actually be repurposed, can actually be reused. Uh, sometimes they can be reused uh, continuously. So, for example, um, <coughs> uh, so for example, uh, containers for uh, liquid uh, detergents. 
um, you may you may be able to get hold of uh, liquid detergents which are uh, either sold directly from the tap so you take your bottle to the, the to the store to the shop and uh, you get it refilled and that's uh, that's essentially a very good way of not producing uh, not producing extra bottles of plastic um, to put in the <coughs> to put in the recycling bin um, you can also think about uh, other things where you are uh, refilling reusing um, Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, Kemal. Um, refuse. Okay. Refuse is uh, rubbish. Okay. Refuse is to uh, say no to something. Okay. So uh, it's it's the same word. It's spelled the same way. It's just it's it's just said it's said differently. So you refuse to make refuse. Okay. So. Okay, so coming back to uh, coming back to our idea of reusing, um, of course, <laughs> I was looking at the. I, I quite like this photo because it's uh, it, it's quite cute. But I was also thinking that um, there are, of course, limits to how many um, how many cans you can recycle around your house, uh, and also how many uh, plastic bottles you can uh, cut the bo cut the tops off and turn into plant pot holders. Uh, so. Of course, these things do have uh, do have their uh, do have their limits, but in general, it is a good way to reduce the amount of material which is ending up in um, ending up in landfill. Uh, okay, so reusing part of reusing is also the idea of exchanging, bartering, uh, swapping. Uh, you could be buying and selling or donating. Uh, some people get quite into um, the idea of, uh, let's say, recycling uh, second-hand uh, things, materials, uh, goods, CDs. Uh, I, I think one of the one one example, for example, is the other uh, records. Uh, okay. Um, something which uh, sort of disappeared and has now come back with a vengeance. Uh, having said that, um, bartering uh, or exchanging can also be very useful in the sense that um, uh, it's a sort of a win-win situation. I'm thinking, um, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, of, a, of an example where we actually swapped a bicycle, a mountain bike for a, a kitchen table which is just a little bit strange but the opportunity came up and these are the sorts of things that you can uh, that you can do so um, an old form of uh, reusing of course is the idea of um, the glass bottles the beer bottles which you take back and you get money for uh, <clears throat> repairing an old bicycle there are quite um, quite a number of uh, a number of places which are now or a number of people who are getting interested in being able to uh, being able to um, adapt and um, modify and uh, uh, bring back to life uh, old old bikes. Um, so. Uh, and again, this is this is pretty useful. There are people I know who actually put electric motors on them, so you can even take something which is pretty old and you can turn it into something which is uh, pretty uh, pretty new. Okay, so um, so you can think of all sorts of uh, all sorts of things to to reuse. Um, the idea of uh, something that's broken. Now, one of the problems, I think, is that some things which break are um, maybe perfectly okay as a piece of, um, as a piece of, uh, let's say, um, as a working machine, except that the electronic part is gone. And that's where a lot of problems start to come out because um, quite often uh, the, it's the electronic bits which are actually going to cause you the trouble. And I'm just thinking about printers, for example. Printers, you may have a printer for your, your, um, 
uh, your your computer. Uh, whatever anybody says, uh, printing is still uh, something which you sometimes have to do because you need a, a physical copy of something or uh, if you're a little bit longer in the tooth like myself you may prefer to print something out to read it um, because it's, it's it's easier on the eye okay uh, however quite often electronic goods are not so easy to repair and in fact if we start to think about things which are a little bit more advanced than printers so phones and what have you um, you get into the territory of um, actually not being able to repair things uh, even if you take them to specialist uh, repair people uh, sometimes because of the, the commercial models because of the business models uh, um, the, uh, the 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 repairs are not actually allowed, and by opening up the opening up the the phone, you actually void the the guarantee, and there's a whole set of problems. In fact, there is actually uh, legislation going through the European Parliament at the moment, which is aimed at the the right to repair, uh, and in particular the the idea of um, if you buy something, you should not necessarily have to only take it back to the uh, to the the, the the people or the, the company that uh, that sold it in the first place. So there are lots and lots of different um, uh, different ways of, let's say, prolonging the life prolonging the life of things. Um, of course, another very uh, another very simple one is just to carry a, a bag around. Uh, for when you go shopping a, a, a foldable canvas bag or a, uh, a cotton bag okay so um, let me just see okay so related to this idea of recycling um, there is um, a concept which you may have heard of uh, which is called upcycling um, now upcycling is not mountain biking it is a concept which has come out of um, the let's say the thinking of um, Gunther Pauli who is one of the um, one of the main protagonists of the the blue economy movement which is uh, uh, which is about let's say getting the most value out of things and then working with these objects in such a way that the value is extended further and so um, part of this is um, not just uh, not just passing things on but it's also uh, maybe restoring things and um, two quotes here uh, the second one is by lady Antonia Edwards uh, who um, she started uh, restoring uh, old things and I think this is quite a nice idea the concept of converting something old and unwanted into something beautiful is a problem that creative people love to solve and I think it's uh, it's not it's a nice idea um, it's a nice idea particularly for things which uh, once upon a time I look just looking at this uh, just looking at this example of the chair um, okay so this is an old type an older style of wooden chair and you probably notice that there are there's some sort of straw here or there's some sort of uh, this was this would have been this would have been repaired at some point by um, a specialist artisan who was a chair maker basically um, uh, it's a sort of like a rattan type of uh, type of material but of course I think the thing here is that um, these types of let's say uh, ways of handling things handling materials um, are actually starting to disappear also that's a part of the problem because of course a chair well you can get a chair for 10 euros from from the local supermarket um, it's not going to last as long as this one but you'll be able to sit on it so uh, so I think this is you, you can imagine that this if this is restored well um, it will look it will look nice and it will uh, last a long time um, so 
yeah, so we've got the these ideas of uh, of restoring the value to things, and I think uh, and also the the personal satisfaction of having if you did this yourself, for example, or if you did this under guidance, the personal satisfaction of creating something, and this leads all leads us all to also to the idea of um, um, let's say one of the things that misses is missing from many. <clears throat> Uh, many jobs in modern economies is a, a contact with a physical, uh, a physical, uh, either a physical product or uh, sometimes with other people. So, uh, which are fundamental, let's say, uh, fundamental things for for many people. Okay, so uh, we've got recycling, and this is what we're going to talk about now. So. Um, it's the process of removing materials from the waste stream, waste stream. Now, if you remember, we had this concept of waste streams, which is uh, different types of materials which you handle in different ways. And the key, the key thing for uh, recycling at a, let's say, waste management at a higher level is this idea of efficient recycling in other words you need to, you need to separate the waste streams in order to have streams which are as homogeneous and as clean as possible when i say clean i mean they're not contaminated with uh, or cross contaminated with other uh, other other things so um, why is this important well the more mixed waste we have the more ends up in landfill because mixed waste is is much much more expensive to actually deal with. Um, so, what can we do at a, at a personal level? At our per, at a personal level, we can separate as well as we can. It also depends on where you live, because some uh, some local councils will. Uh, will collect certain things and not other things. So uh, I do realise that this is um, uh, this is very very much uh, linked to to your your personal uh, your personal um, uh, situation. So we've got uh, we've got collecting, uh, we've got the sorting, which is pushing things into different categories, uh, into the different waste streams, and processing. And of course, um, some of, sometimes it's fairly obvious, okay, a newspaper is a newspaper, okay, it's going to go in the paper bin. Sometimes it's not so obvious, you have a, a plastic container that's actually made of two different types of plastic. Do you put them together? Do you separate them? What do you do? Uh, you have, um, you may have uh, wet waste or compost, uh, organic waste, which is uh, which is collected separately as well. Um, I had an example just the other day, uh, which I, I was. It, it sort of struck me because um, this was a coffee machine in a school, and the finally, finally. <laughs> The coffee machine was uh, giving out coffee in paper cups. Uh, you know the, the, those sorts of uh, the, the sort of fairly sturdy uh, paper cups. Um, and this, I think, this this is fantastic because before they were the plastic cups, but it was the plastic which no one wanted to recycle. So this is a step forward. Uh, then I looked at the bin. And near the coffee machine, there were uh, there were three bins. There was a paper bin, there was a general waste bin, and then there was a sort of a there was another bin which I think was plastic, but I'm, it wasn't so clearly labelled. And basically, the coffee cups had ended up in each of the bins. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, why would people do that? And then I realised because it's not clear, because you can't put a, a dirty coffee cup in the paper even though it's made of paper. So uh, making things clear to people uh, is part of the, uh, is part of the, part of the problem. And I don't know whether anyone has ever come across this, uh, this app here. 
Um, I, I am in no way connected with, uh, with, this, uh, with the makers of this app or anything. I just happen to use it every so often because one of the things which gets in the way of uh, recycling is um, knowing what the thing is actually made of so that you know how to dispose of it. So Junker is a is an app which is now available in uh, several different countries I think um, and basically I uh, it's it's amazing <laughs> you you point your camera from your phone at the barcode on the product and it tells you what the package is what the packaging is made of and this is um, this is very, very much driven from a grassroots level because people spend a couple of minutes taking a photograph of something and then uh, putting in the data, and the database is growing exponentially. So uh, there's a lot of information. You have to write an X. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so this is the. Um, I think this is this type of thing is is very useful because. Uh, it does help you with uh, the confusion. Where do I put this? I think also uh, we have to, as cons excuse me, I think also as consumers, we have to put pressure on manufacturers to simplify and clarify the packaging. Um, of course, uh, manufacturers are going to try and um, make their packaging unique so that it's interesting and it attracts us. But if you're like me, 95% um, of the time you just go for the same stuff in the supermarket anyway. So it doesn't matter whether it's in a, a brown paper bag or whether it's in a purple box with red stars on it. It, it doesn't matter. Okay. So, but I do think that um, we need. Uh, we need to be helped in order to um, in order to recycle well. Uh, again, uh, just a conversation with some students the other day. Um, they brought up the question, the the, the topic of um, uh, the topic of recycling, and uh, I sort of just asked the question, "Well, how could you how could you make it easy for people?" Well. Um, the the answer I got was well if you find people more if you make the fines more uh, if you make it economically more damaging then people won't do it well I'm not so sure about that anyway okay so um, so it's very important to uh, to separate and sort correctly um, because this has a big big impact on what happens further down the line okay so uh, for example if you have a uh, a cardboard box which is dirty let's say a, pe a pizza box is a classic example great cardboard it's made of recycled cardboard it's fantastic but the problem is that that can no longer be recycled because it's it's full of uh, it's got tomato grease and stuff on it so um, you have to be very very careful with these things um, and remembering that this whole thing is about um, this whole thing is about a waste stream. So it's like a flow of materials. It's a flow of materials which have been extracted, transformed, and now you're going to transform them again into either energy or you're going to re-transform them back into what they were uh, what they were started what they started at, as or you're going to transform them into something else so you need it's the quality of the separated material that is going to really uh, really impact the uh, the quality of what you get out it's the old um, it's the old hi-fi uh, adage which is garbage in garbage out it doesn't matter how good your stereo is if your record is is ruined it's still going to sound like a, a ruined record so um, because of course separating waste is is a mechanical it's a, a physical process a mechanical process um, 
automated systems are starting to uh, starting to make a big impact, but there's still a lot of manual stuff in there because one of the problems is to uh, recognize what things are made of. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of uh, there's still a lot of uh, scope for uh, for improvement there. So as I mentioned, um, <coughs> mix and dirty materials uh, best not to. So and the other example is the um, is ceramics. So if you have a plate, if you break a plate in the kitchen, don't put it in the glass and don't put the light bulbs in the glass either. Yeah, they're made of glass, but they don't go in the glass. Um, why? Well, because they are not pure glass. And um, and a small amount of ceramic, a small amount of ceramic in a uh, in a glass uh, recycling glass container will completely ruin <clears throat> will completely ruin the, uh, the that that glass in terms of recycling. Um, this is to do with the chemical properties of the of the materials. Okay, um, so some of these things, as I say, uh, are um, accepted or not accepted locally. I'm thinking about tetra packs, uh, the aluminium, particularly the multi um, the containers which have many different layers on them maybe two or three different layers. So uh, sometimes they need uh, special treatment. OK, um, so looking at um, looking at the roles of the people involved, of course, um, the government, uh, whether that's national or local, has uh, a lot of, should have a lot of interest in promoting uh, separation at at source, so that's that's a, a, the household um, funding for um, recycling infrastructure and also raising awareness about the importance of separating at source. Um, of course, I'm concentrating here on household waste, but of course there is also the waste from industries. But quite often, the waste from industry is a little is is more specialized in the sense that um, according to the type of industry you have, you may have, for example, specialist chemical waste, which obviously has to be treated in a particular way. Um, and there, uh, the influence of, let's say, large scale economics of process become important. But I'm not going to go into that because it gets very, very technical. Um, Institutions, big institutions. So, one of the institutions, of course, is the education system uh, and the schools, um, raising awareness and um, also, as we say, walking the talk, which is uh, doing what you preach, uh, doing what you say should be done. So, um, this, uh, in, in fact, this whole uh, this whole project is part of the idea of let's say raising um, ra raising awareness about environmental um, uh, environmental issues associated with not well with plastics in particular but um, in with environmental issues in general so um, and then of course individuals so some individuals seem to be more switched on about things than others but I think rather than Rather than trying to turn everyone into an eco warrior, um, I think it's more important just that this idea of um, throwing things in the right bin uh, just becomes a habit. And if you don't know the habit of asking, say, okay, well, where do I put that? Okay. Um, and part of being the individual consumer can also be sending feedback to companies saying hey why do you put a why do you put a, a plastic window in a box of pasta in a box of pasta I know what's in the box it's pasta just just because there's a plastic window there doesn't make me um, it doesn't make me any any less any less secure any less uh, sure that the pasta is in there so uh, okay so um, waste sorting facilities um, so you, your your stuff is being collected and it's being transported and um, you're being 
the waste is then sort of selected and sorted in more um, in larger scale facilities of course and part of this is is it where is it going to end up according to what it is and according to uh, the state it's in so um, you may have recovery of energy you may have um, uh, you may have a, a secondary uh, feedstock or you may have it being completely um, recycled to what it was originally as a as a as a product so um, according to what you're doing um, you will have different waste streams okay so um, the organic material is easy because this is kitchen and garden waste uh, the now the plastic, I'll come back to plastic in a minute, um, iron metals typically uh, um, mostly completely recyclable, aluminium is 100% recyclable, um, cardboard and paper you can easily do lots of things with uh, cardboard and paper and get that back. Now electronic waste, this is a, um, this is a bit of a problem. Um, because it needs uh, it's not just a case of smashing the circuits up they need things need to be dismantled in certain ways and um, there's a lot of work going on about how to uh, extract the um, the rare and or semi the rare or not so rare um, elements uh, which are used in electronics and this does get very very technical because um, you will have elements that you have never heard of but which are absolutely vital so just to give you a couple of examples um, for the touch screen you need indium um, no one's probably ever heard it not non-chemists have probably never heard of indium uh, but it's an, it's an element which is it's a metal which is used in very small quantities but there's not that much of it around uh, it's actually quite quite difficult to find uh, it's not all over the world so um, other other elements the rare earth the rare earths the lanthanides the uh, your presidimium and uh, neodymium which are used in magnets and stuff like this so uh, even gold and silver for example there's more gold in a ton of iPhones than there is in a ton of rock so um, there's a lot of work being done to try and uh, get the uh, get the value back for these metals. Um, okay, so glass is easy. We know about glass. Tires are a problem, um, but typically what happens with tires is they get shredded and used. Uh, you, we've all seen the the kids play playgrounds, uh, the sort of the semi bouncy, um, springy floor flooring which is used this is typically made of um, of recycled shredded uh, tires um, and then you've got construction waste from construction now coming back to coming back to plastics <coughs> um, or plastic the big problem is this it's it's one word which actually refers to a physical property <laughs> you talk about something as being plastic which has now become the name for uh, the generic name for well there are I don't know how many different types of plastic but even just thinking about uh, the stuff you, that you will have around the house you will have everything if you've got something like uh, Lego you've got um, you've got acryl uh, acrylobutanitrile plastics you've got styrenes you've got polystyrenes you've got polyethylenes you've got polypropylenes and it's all in your kitchen doing stuff holding liquids and things okay uh, you've got pet and the problem is that chemically these are all quite different things and so they need to be treated in different ways you can't just put them together and make more plastic because plastic is uh, uh, is just is just a generic catch-all term um, and this makes me want to say make one other comment about uh, about the idea of um, about the idea of, of replacements for plastics um, 
you could ask, well, why are there so many of these things? Well, there are so many because the chemistry is very flexible and you can do lots of stuff, okay? Um, and over time, people have become very clever at, at working out, uh, let's say, the right way to do something in order to get uh, a in order to get the characteristics that you want. Okay, um, so alternatives to plastics are going to have to have similar chemical characteristics or similar, similar let's say, physical characteristics. So um, let me just ask you, and I don't expect an answer here, of course. Uh, could you imagine an alternative material for a computer monitor or a laptop. So that's something which uh, which might be worth thinking about. Anyway, the point is that this is very, this is difficult. This is very, very difficult. Um, but it's absolutely urgent. Absolutely urgent. Okay, so um, part of the uh, projectors, yes. Yeah, or just think about a projector, all of the stuff in a projector. Uh, um, a computer monitor. I was thinking uh, making a computer monitor out of wood. Mm, I'm not sure <laughs> whether that would work properly. Um, okay, uh, out of sight, out of mind. You must have uh, you you must have heard this expression, or maybe you haven't. But I'm sure that uh, for every every language will almost certainly have its own version of this. What you don't see, you don't think about. So um, a few years ago, China was quite happily taking in uh, was quite happily taking in waste from the rest of the world for cash, basically. Um, but at some point, they realised that this was not sustainable um, because they were being inundated with low quality uh, low quality trash or low quality rubbish which um, was probably not what they were thinking of in the beginning they were probably thinking of thinking of uh, uh, getting uh, more um, more valuable uh, more valuable uh, waste such as the uh, such as pet and uh, various uh, various plastics so um, China shut the shut the, the gates, and so everybody sort of started looking around. Well, everybody, the Western countries, the US and, and Europe, started looking around and uh, started to look at Vietnam, uh, amongst other countries. So these are just two examples. But the point is that developing countries are starting to, uh, and quite rightly, quite rightly, they're starting to uh, say, hey, hold on a minute, why do we have to deal with all of your rubbish just because you guys want a clean environment? Mm. Okay, so the point is we need to do something about this, and we can't just shift it around um, because this is just moving the problem <coughs> around the system. It's not actually uh, solving any problems here. Okay, so... Uh, this is, I thought, uh, as I was preparing these uh, these slides uh, or this material, um, I came across this article, and I thought this was actually quite uh, quite interesting. This uh, this this comment, which was, um, would it really make much difference if the Lego castle and the 359 million tons of plastic that the world makes a year was recyclable? Is the type of plastic the problem, or is it the fact that we are overwhelmed with vast quantities of waste we cannot process? Okay, so I was just thinking about this because Lego is um, is, and again, I have no connections, no commercial connections, and I, I have no um, uh, no interest in the thing other than a, a, other than a love of the of the of the toy uh, from from childhood through to adulthood. Okay, so. But I was just thinking about this because if you take something like this this particular product, um, it's clear there's a lot of value in it. But the value, if you like, is in being able to play with it and being able to make stuff and then undo things and then the next day you make something else and then the next day and then maybe in 30 years' time you hand it on to your kids uh, and 
because this stuff is essentially well it's essentially indestructible as long as you don't heat it to 80 degrees it's okay um, but it just stays so this this idea of a plastic so maybe the ex sorry maybe the example of the Lego is actually quite extreme because it's clear that this has to be durable it has to, you don't want in this particular instance you don't want something which is leaving pieces and leaving flakes because you know you've seen kids with this stuff they put it in their mouths they chew it and they do all sorts of stuff so it's clear that uh, recyclable a recyclable product in this case I'm not sure what the advantages are because you know uh, if you're going to buy the toy you're going to buy the toy whether it's recyclable or not in this particular case it is something which lasts in time um, but looking at the idea of recyclable plastic as a let's say a general um, as a general principle uh, sometimes let's say the idea of something being recyclable is uh, maybe a bit of a red herring in other words it's something which may be so for example a plastic spoon which is recyclable well what about a metal spoon yeah uh, um, plates which are recycle which are which you can throw in the bin and recycle because remember recycling just because you can recycle it doesn't mean that it doesn't cost any energy that it doesn't take any effort so I think this is a this is an important uh, it's actually an important point which is that some things some things um, some things maybe we shouldn't be we shouldn't be thinking about making them recyclable because they shouldn't be recyclable we should be using different things so maybe this is something that we have to think about carefully about um, another problem here okay so we're talking about now this is this is interesting because this was from a, a survey by the Green Alliance in I think it's in the UK this this was they did a survey uh, of supermarkets um, and we have the idea okay supermarkets are there they they're just it's commercial concern just to make money of course well it's a business however the the answers that these uh, these businesses gave to the survey which was about the use of about packaging um, were quite interesting because they were saying that uh, we are aware that by switching from plastic to other materials we may in some cases be increasing our carbon footprint okay so so this is this is the um, let's say the problem of too much packaging too much plastic packaging within the bigger problem of co2 okay because in the end if we're talking about carbon footprints we're talking about co2 we're talking about production of co2 and you might be thinking oh hold on a minute this is a bit strange because surely we must be wanting to reduce all of this in order to uh, in order to uh, make the world better well this is this is an interesting calculation because um, uh, I sort of rooted around a little bit and got some information but just to make it really sort of clear um, and I am in no way uh, condoning the use of <laughs> condoning the use of plastic bottles or whatever but let's just think about this a minute um, if you take a glass bottle uh, now this is a this is obviously it looks like a wine bottle but it could be an oil bottle of oil or whatever typically 750 milliliters um, the weight of the bottle according to what's in it can be anything from about half a kilo up to nearly a kilo this would be a champagne so something which has to withstand pressure okay uh, this would this would probably be a, a cheap uh, a cheaper uh, uh, cheap bottle of red wine something like that okay so you've got let's say half a kilo plus your 750 milliliters of wine okay so that's uh, that's 1.25 kilos yeah per bottle um, 
plastic. Now, of course, you're not really going to put wine in a plastic bottle, but it could be water. It could be water. So 750 milliliters of water, let's say. Um, the bottle is around about 125 grams, approximately. Uh, could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. Depends on the uh, on the material, um, but you can you can you can see that there is a there's a big difference in the weight between the two. So if you multiply this for excuse me, if you multiply you multiply this for by um, six bottles in a box and 30 boxes, 32 boxes on a pallet, and um, I don't know 10 pallets in a truck. The weight difference gets gets to be quite significant, and that weight difference, well, it impacts on how much fuel you're going to use to transport that stuff around around the country or to the other side of the world. Okay, so these are, these are some of the things that you that we have to we have to sort of take into into consideration, um, and. You, know, you can you can argue you can argue whether uh, in some instances it is actually better it's actually a better use uh, it's actually better use of resource to use plastic bottles which can be fully recycled or perhaps refilled after after adequate washing um, rather than uh, moving things around with glass. Okay, so this is just just one example. Okay, okay, so. Um, we've been looking at uh, we've been looking at different different or we are looking at different types of waste waste stream waste streams sorry um, another one which is important is the organic waste and of course uh, this does link to um, the idea of food waste and I think there was that terrible statistic of a third of food produced is wasted which is uh, absolutely appalling if we think about it um, sometimes the waste is um, intentional sometimes it is unintentional okay um, but quite often what happens with the organic waste is it's not collected separately um, if it's collected separately you can deal with it uh, you can deal with it in a, in a particular way um, but if it's mixed in with other stuff, it start it, it actually it's a bit of a problem because um, it gets buried in landfill, and of course, well, what we've got here is we've got some bacteria, and the landfill uh, typically creates anaerobic conditions. In other words, there's uh, uh, there's not a lot of oxygen around, and certainly in the middle of it. But these are uh, these are absolutely ideal conditions for um, uh, for anaerobic bacteria to uh, uh, to proliferate. And quite often, uh, well, what are they doing? They're just basically they're breaking stuff down, which is fine. But what they're doing is they're using it to get energy, of course. Um, and they're quite often producing methane. CH4. Now I don't know how many chemists there are out there. Probably none. But um, just to give you an idea, this is a, these are molecules of methane which are floating up into the atmosphere. But of course, me methane is the gas that we use in the kitchen. Um, it's the gas that sometimes we use in cars, according to uh, where we are. Uh, we may have a methane car, um, but it is a greenhouse gas, and uh, it is a greenhouse gas which is approximately, I think it's 17 or 18 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Now, um, I'm not going to go into the, into the let's say, the, the physics of, of that stuff, um, but it's just all that means is that you don't need as much methane to have the same effect as CO2. Uh, you need about a, approximately a 20th, something like that. Okay. So, um, and of course this, uh, this gas is just being released into the atmosphere. So um, one 
thing that you can do with organic waste, and this is one of the one of the solutions which is uh, which people are working on. Uh, it's the idea of biogas production. So you could uh, you can th you you can think about uh, collecting the organic waste and uh, essentially you're fermenting it basically um, you let the bacteria do what they do you do it under anaerobic conditions and you uh, you get uh, you get biogas which is methane which you can use to generate electricity now um, from a certain point of view it's good because you've dealt with the waste from another point of view though again the, the broader picture is you are still producing CO2 because when you burn the methane, when you burn methane, you will get CO2 as a product of the, the combustion. Okay, so uh, this is, I think you're probably getting the idea that um, we have to be very careful to be, to not be just shifting the problem around the system. So, Everything, you know, we collect all the organic waste, fantastic, because we're dealing with it, but then we're producing lots of, um, lots of methane. But of course, this could be an alternative fuel for, uh, instead of pulling the methane out of the ground, uh, we, uh, we use it from, uh, from biogas. But there's still work to be done in order to um, uh, address this problem, which is the anything that involves carbon combustion is going to produce co2 okay so okay we could also we can compost some uh, organic waste uh, composting is good because it allows you uh, to re um, uh, revive soil with um, organic materials and so this is a, an aerobic um, an aerobic process because it's ha happening under conditions with oxygen okay and so you can use this as a as a as a type of natural more natural fertilizer rather than a chemical fertilizer um, <clears throat> and I, as I was as I was working on this material, um, I came across this uh, this uh, uh, a website of a company that's actually involved in promoting uh, making compost piles on a commercial basis. So uh, they were saying it's actually pretty quick. You can get this very quickly. Okay, so uh, what goes in here? Um, all sorts of stuff that you can basically decompose using bacteria. Um, another uh, another thing I came across, which I hadn't really thought about, but it, then uh, it struck me. I think I probably did this as uh, I probably did this uh, at school, as a, <laughs> back in the time of the dinosaurs. Um, wormery. Okay, now these are, this is an earthworm, uh, 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 an earthworm which is uh, which are vital parts of the uh, garden ecosystems. Um, because they are very much involved in um, turning this, what we call turning the soil over, aerating the soil, and pulling <coughs> uh, pulling in di uh, pulling organic material into the soil, eating it, digesting it. And uh, I came across several links for um, uh, for making um, wormeries at school with uh, younger children so this could be something which is uh, which could be an interesting idea if uh, if you can get over the factor the yuck factor okay okay so um, if the if the pre-sorting process is done well um, okay uh, you can compost and you can make biogas uh, quite efficiently and this can reduce the volume of waste going to the landfills uh, and also prevent uh, methane release to the air. So obviously this is good for both um, energy and um, soil quality. Okay, um, but to make the best of this you need waste treatment facilities that are close to the source of waste. Okay, uh, now this in itself is a bit contentious because 
most people um, don't really want waste uh, don't really want waste facilities next door um, obviously depending on what the waste facilities are uh, however maybe this is something which is uh, speaking to uh, the idea of sustainable cities in the sense of um, rather than having energy production and waste treatment as centralized uh, units you have them dispersed out across the uh, across the territory in order to um, maximize the uh, maximize coverage and minimize the transport between the uh, waste producer waste producers which is which are us and local industries um, and the waste treatment so I think this is something which uh, which will probably evolve evolve with time. Um, okay, so recycling, fantastic if you can do it, but sometimes you can't, uh, and sometimes you only have two more possibilities, and one of those possibilities is energy recovery. Uh, and energy recovery is uh, of course well <laughs> it is what it says it's getting the energy back from the the chemical bonds in the materials okay so remembering that every everything including ourselves uh, are made of is made of um, uh, chemicals of various types uh, and chemicals are made of elements joined together and the joining of the elements uh, creates bonds and the bonds contain the energy which hold the hold everything together um, essentially uh, one thing that we can do with waste which we can't uh, treat in any other way is to try and get that energy back okay so um, Typically, this is uh, these are the incinerators. This is very, very contentious from the point of view of um, uh, for, of the environment because uh, historically, this has never been done well. And even though nowadays, and there are several cities, I think, in France and in Germany, where a lot of energy is recovered by burning waste, and the energy is then uh, used in um, remote uh, heating, teleriscaldamento uh, in Italian, um, so the, the remote heating, which um, is used to, uh, used to power and to heat uh, communities uh, near the uh, near the plants but here we're talking about uh, plants which were built incinerators which were built relatively recently with the latest technologies and also with a uh, with a, a definite focus on handling um, uh, handling the emissions that wasn't true in the past where basically incinerators burned anything and badly and produced all sorts of uh, problems so um, we think about um, we think about the problems of the dioxins the PCBs which were being uh, uh, being burnt at uh, um, suboptimal temperatures okay so the thing here is that this has to be done on a big scale um, it's called mass burn and it has to be done on a big scale in order to make it uh, not only economically viable but technically viable as well okay so it's very very important that uh, if this is going to be done uh, it's very important that it's done in the right way um, and again of course in a city no one wants their house next to to be next to an incinerator because well can you really trust people to do the right thing and uh, and keep the furnace at the right temperature okay well this is part of uh, this is part of the let's say the um, 
part of the work of the of the the local uh, local governments in uh, in convincing people, but also in managing things properly. Of course, the bottom line here, though, is also that this does produce CO2. So this could substitute burning oil. It could su could substitute burning coal, but you're still producing CO2. Okay. Okay. So um, refuse derived fuel. So in some cases, it's a, you are able to um, uh, to actually um, derive a type of uh, fuel stock from uh, from waste, um, and as it points out here, it can it can be a lot env environmentally. It's not ideal, but environmentally, it's a lot cleaner than digging a hole in the ground and extracting the oil um, in, the, in the normal way. Um, it does allow you to uh, diversify uh, sources of energy. So um, part, of the, uh, part of the thing about renewables is, well, what if the wind doesn't blow? What if the sun doesn't shine? Um, and that's where you get into the thing about uh, energy storage, which is uh, a completely different thing here. Um, so RDF, this uh, ref refuse deri derived fuel, is um, it's a type of, let's say, it's a type of petrol, if you like, but it's a lot cleaner. It burns more cleanly, but it still produces CO2. So we're always back to that, uh, that problem. Okay, um, so what about taking things a little bit more into uh, a little bit more extreme? Now, this is where we get into the uh, we start to get into the world of uh, heavy duty industrial chemistry, um, which is going on anyway. Okay, it's just that uh, what we can do is we can take um, we can take the uh, the organic. Part now organic here. It's not intended as the um, uh, the kitchen waste. This is materials from organic chemistry. So in other words, your plastics, your synthetic products. Okay, um, and so there's a lot of work being done to work out how to uh, how to take mixtures of plastics which may be difficult to separate and basically break them down into what's called syngas. Uh, a syngas is a synth synthesis gas which is a mixture of, in this case it's carbon monoxide, hydrogen and methane. And the idea here is that these, this is a feedstock. This is a, a normal feedstock for many industrial uh, industrial processes that you've never heard of um, and so it's something which could sort of go back in rather than getting these things from petrol which is typically where you uh, where you get um, syngas from at the moment okay so it's it's not ideal okay but it's on the on the way to um, let's say research chemically recycling okay chemically recycling back into materials which in the end are actually very useful so I'm just looking at these bins here these are obviously made of plastic um, what else could you make them out of metal maybe but that's a lot of metal and they're a bit heavy so it's you can see that the the the, the situation is, is rather is rather complicated because um, we have a lot of things that we have got used to using and that we, we would say that we need as part of modern, let's say, modern life. Um, but we're not so sure about how we should be making these things. So, OK, so gasification is another uh, another process which can be used. This gives industrial intermediates and oops, let me just go. OK, and then. I think the last one is um, what's called pyrolysis. Now we have to be very, very careful that that pyrolysis is not the same as combustion, okay? Because com combustion is when you react 
something with oxygen and you get stuff okay you get energy and you get uh, CO2 and you get water and you get other things as well okay this is not combustion uh, you're not doing it in the absence of oxygen you're typically doing it with catalysts and you're basically you're breaking molecules apart um, this will give you some gas this will give you some uh, solid waste, it will give you some liquid and so you get a series of different things uh, from this uh, from this process um, and again organic material here refers to synthetic materials such as plastics and such as uh, um, things which have been worked up from petrol in the first place okay so this is a, a way of going back to let's say the starting material so you could maybe polymerize again uh, this type of thing okay now we're going to in another session we're going to talk in more detail about the plastics and I, I promise I won't kill you with the chemistry um, the but in essence, this is this is let's say the uh, the most extreme uh, the most extreme thing that you can do because what you're doing is you're you're breaking the thing apart, um, not in any subtle way at all. Okay, uh, some plastics you can actually decompose back into the monomers and you just repolymerize them. That's that's easy, but that obviously refer relies on um, having uh, it relies on having uh, waste streams which are uh, cleanly separated. Okay, so the last one. So if you <coughs> if you can't reuse it, if you can't recycle it, if you can't <coughs> get energy from it, the only thing you can do is landfill it, um, and this is obviously the least desirable of any of the waste disposal methods because it's quite clear that it takes up space um, and it also has a very high uh, environmental cost um, so just I mean, you can imagine that the water the water table under something like this would be uh, pretty polluted with all of the various bits and pieces that are things which are leaching out of the uh, of the materials okay um, and it's becoming a big problem and in fact one of the reasons why Europe and uh, the US have sent were sending their materials to China is because there's no space here or because people don't want it here um, so it's ending up in Africa, it's ending up in Vietnam, it's ending up in other places um, and of course in places which are maybe uh, less economically uh, developed or technologically developed uh, this is a um, this is a very uh, it's the main method of waste disposal you just dump it and of course as we uh, as we saw right at the beginning um, this is obviously not uh, not sustainable because these things this stuff is hanging around hanging around okay so um, just a quote from this guy who is um, or who was I think he still is actually um, uh, a senior director at the World Bank which is uh, in which is engaged in uh, this the idea of um, sustainability um, so solid waste management is everybody's problem um, and we need we need to have in, um, effective and proper solid waste management in order to make sure or in order to, to meet sustainable development goals um, so it's not enough to just uh, say yeah we've uh, we're doing great stuff in one part of our environmental uh, approaches but then you're throwing stuff away um, with the other so it's it, this is a big it's obviously it's a big problem um, but we have to start somewhere so okay so right this is a summary slide um, so uh, it's quite clear that we are 
reaching or we have reached unsustainable levels of waste production. This is too much. Um, so although we can think about uh, reusing, recycling, um, probably the best thing, well in fact the only thing really, is to actually uh, work out how to reduce the amount of waste that we produce in the first place. Um, in the meantime we can we can manage what we have or what we do make uh, by being uh, as diligent as possible um, about separating so that we get homogeneous waste streams uh, because this helps this helps uh, this helps the, the the steps the later steps of recycling okay and I think this is uh, this is the key thing at the bottom um, I mean all of this stu this stuff here is technical okay uh, it actually requires us to be informed and to be critically aware of what's happening now it's it's always e as, I, as I said about the the incinerators no one wants an incinerator in their back garden um, and it's very easy to to uh, to push the problem onto other people who are least able to defend themselves from the problem uh, in particularly in the face of um, uh, in the face of interests, economic interests and economic powers, um, but I do think it, there is an effort, there is a, 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 an ethical element to this as well, which means that um, we do need to be, we need to inform ourselves uh, and to also to push for, for 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 changes, for small changes, where we can. Okay, so I think this is. Uh, I think this would be the my my takeaway message from from all of this stuff about um, waste waste management. Okay, so I, I'm going to I'm going to ask before I sort of step uh, before I step into the uh, into the the ecosystem stuff. I'd like to uh, just open uh, open up to any questions or any comments here. So. Uh, so um, Carmen is saying I agree with you 100% the whale was found dead in the beach with 16 kilo kilograms of plastic in its stomach yeah yeah this yeah okay, do you want me to open the microphone yeah yeah if you can please okay just a moment just to give me uh, and just turn on the microphone only if you have a question please don't Okay, anyone has a question, please uh, turn on the microphone and make to the question to our... Uh, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure what... That, I, I can't hear because it's, uh, it's very interrupted sound. Yeah, because there are people that... Okay, just... Hello. Okay. Nobody. Any, anybody? Anybody got any questions or comments? Uh, maybe in the chat. So there it is. Yeah. Uh, there's well, there's just one or two things in the chat. Okay. So. Okay. Right. So if everyone's okay, I'm That's going good. to I'm going to move over to the ecosystem stuff. So if you can just bear with me two seconds. Uh, I'm just going to. Do, 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 do. I need to save that. Just two seconds, and I need mm -hmm. to open this one. Mm -hmm. Open it. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so. Okay, uh, so. This is so I've sort of started here, so I'll, I'll probably finish this one next week. Um, okay, so what what we're going to what I'm going to start to talk about now um, 
this is so we talked about waste and this is waste is obviously very much associated with uh, human um, uh, human activity okay uh, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to I'd like to sort of shift the focus over to um, uh, I'd like to shift the focus over to let's say something which is a little bit more uh, academic although hopefully it won't be too academic uh, because we're going to talk about ecosystems so we're going to be talking uh, a bit more about biology biological systems and uh, and some and, and such forth okay so um, I'm going to start with a couple of definitions now again I don't know amongst the audience how many uh, how many uh, biologists we've got or how many scientists we've got maybe we even have some ecologists um, so if you know if this is stuff which you which resonates with you please do uh, please do let me know um, okay so a simple definition of an ecosystem so uh, a community of, or a group of living organisms that live in and interact with each other in a specific environment so that they live and interact with each other in a specific environment okay so um, we've got a picture of a forest here uh, the forest obviously contains trees and shrubs and small flowers and you've got dead leaves and you've got new leaves and uh, you've got animals you've got insects you've got bacteria you've got uh, all sorts of things which are constantly interacting with each other um, and so of course these things are going to be uh, affected by um, these living things are going to be affected by their physical environment which in this case will consist of uh, how much sunlight they get how warm they get etc uh, etc et or the chemical environment which is um, are they in a place where there's very little oxygen so we don't usually associate um, uh, forests with anaerobic environments but you could imagine that uh, under some rocks uh, there's not a lot of <laughs> air moving around okay um, or nutrients you can have places which are rich in nutrients or uh, you can have uh, places which are relatively poor in nutrients okay so this is a very simple definition um, I'm going to sort of make this a little bit more scientific now uh, and I'm going to introduce these two uh, these two rather rather technical terms um, which um, which go together to make a physically defined environment uh, made up of two inseparable components the biotope and the biosynosis now um, the biotope is the physical environment and the physical environment has specific physical characteristics and so you have the climate such so rainfall sunshine uh, average temperature all of this sort of stuff humidity um, there's a difference between a rainforest and a, a tie um, and the tiger uh, the northern boreal forests for example concentrations of nutrients in the soil um, the pH the type of soil what type of rocks is it uh, is it uh, come is it sitting on um, how high is this uh, how high is this ecosystem are we in the alpine region or are we in are we in the desert okay um, so all of these things sort of uh, are part of the abiotic part of the, the, the ecosystem. The biosynosis, on the other hand, is the biotic part of the uh, ecosystem, um, which is uh, which is the uh, it's the living part, it's the organisms, and so that's everything which is constantly. Uh, interacting and the key word here is interdependence and I think that uh, I think that one of the things that uh, people are often um, uh, often guilty of I think is thinking that 
the the ecosystem is something which is out there well actually we are part of it of course even sitting in our houses and even sort of being in cities and uh, modern life and what have you but the ecosystem is part of the is we are we are part of part of it um, and we even ourselves and if we think about our um, the uh, the flora of bacteria that inhabit our our bodies um, no matter how much soap we use, <laughs> okay, uh, we are uh, we are um, as um, Walt Whitman said, uh, we are multitudes. So, okay, so uh, ecosystems themselves can be uh, can be big or small, and we talk about this in terms of uh, scales of magnitude. Now, I hope this isn't. Uh, too unfamiliar but um, magnitude is this idea of things which increase logarithmically okay so uh, you, you can start off with something that's very small and then you have a tenfold increase and then a tenfold increase and then a tenfold increase so um, you can have in other words you can have big ecosystems which cover large areas and you can have uh, contained ecosystems which are very particular sometimes even to uh, it sometimes even uh, even to the extent of it a particular place a particular part of a particular valley sometimes you have uh, very particular um, very special conditions which allow the um, uh, allow those animals and those organisms to interact and uh, and evolve together. Okay, so um, let's just have a look at this. So we've got micro scale. Um, so we've got things like a pond, a puddle. A puddle is a, a small uh, is a bit of water left over from a rain shower. Now, if you think about that, if it rains heavily. Um, and maybe uh, maybe you have some plants outside in a pot and the rain gets in the pot or gets in the plant and the the water gets a bit dirty and stuff and it sticks around for maybe a week ten days and then it starts to dry up but um, you can you can guarantee that within that week or ten days in that water there's lots of stuff happening there are lots of organisms, lots of little things swimming around and eating each other and doing all sorts of stuff. Okay, you can have you could have an ecosystem which is a tree trunk. So if we look at this, we have the moss. Uh, we have uh, we will have um, nematodes. We will have tardigrades. We'll have all sorts of things living in the living in the moss and we will have ants and uh, other insects uh, walking over it excuse me looking for food we will have bacteria we've got all sorts of things there um, then we have a meso uh, a meso level system which is a medium scale that could be a lake could be a forest now I think most most of us will be familiar with um, places probably in your own countries which have very particular very particular um, organisms so uh, good examples are lakes which are isolated um, and may contain uh, particular types of fish that you only find in that particular lake um, so uh, there are quite uh, they can be quite but these things can be these these areas can be quite large um, but they're not they're not so large that you would class them as a biome now a biome is very much a large scale ecosystem or a collection of ecosystems with similar um, with similar factors so if you think about uh, similar biotic abiotic factors so uh, if you think about a rainforest um, you could imagine that uh, at the edges of the rainforest uh, you will have a different type of ecosystem to something which is right in the middle of the rainforest um, you have the canopy which are the the, tr the tops of the trees which will have a different set of a different type of 
uh, or a different set of organisms compared to the uh, compared to the undergrowth, which is in shadow and it doesn't get as much light. Um, it traps the humidity. So you've got uh, even within um, even within big uh, potentially big um, biomes like rainforests, you will have uh, different sets of different types of uh, ecosystems. Okay, so so we've we've talked so we've talked about uh, ecosystems. We've talked about the biome. I'm going to come back to biomes in a in a couple of minutes. Um, but we also you may also come across the word habitat. Uh, now habitats are essentially related to species, related to animals or plants um, or microorganisms, if you like. Um, essentially, a habitat is, let's say, the natural part of the, uh, the ecosystem, the environment where the species lives, where it reproduces, where it finds food, where it finds shelter. So thinking about the, uh, thinking about the, the, the tropical rainforest, um, you will have animals that live in the undergrowth, uh, things like peccaries and things like that, and pigs and stuff. Um, they are in a very different habitat to the monkeys, which are living up in the in the canopy. Okay. Um, of course, habitats contain physical and biological features uh, in terms of what lives there and the conditions in which it's living. Um, so essentially, this idea of the habitat is that the habitat is the natural home of the of the organism, and so of course the the um, uh, the ecosystem will essentially contain a series of habitats according to the the animal. Okay, so if you like, it's the animal, it's the ecosystem from the animal's point of view. Um, so it's where you find your food, where you find your mates, where you find your shelter. Um, so, uh, okay, so just to give you some different examples of habitats here. Um, so the first one is a is a rock pool. So uh, if you think about uh, if you think about the sea, if you think about the seashore uh, on a rocky seashore where you have uh, cliffs or where you have rocks that come out to the sea, come down to the sea and as the tide comes in and out it will uh, maybe water will be trapped and sometimes these this water never never quite evaporates never quite dries out and so you get pools remaining and within those pools you will have collections of uh, animals like anemones and crabs and all sorts of little bits and pieces um, and these things can actually be quite, uh, they can be quite stable. Um, another type of, uh, uh, another type of, uh, uh, another type of situation we have here is the, um, is a meadow. Okay, so we've got meadow, which uh, is a, f a field with uh, different types of plants. So different types of plants, you will have different types of insects. Uh, different types of insects, you will have uh, probably small mammals like shrews or maybe mice, which are um, uh, which are uh, feeding on uh, the insects. And then you will you may have slightly larger mammals like stoats and weasels and things which are feeding on the mice, uh, according to where you are. Okay. Um, if we think about uh, the desert, uh, deserts are well. They are they are as they say. There's not a lot of life here, but there is life, uh, and that's that's important. It's important to remember that uh, although there's not a lot, there is there, there is some. Um, and so you have uh, typically uh, you have typically arthropods, uh, your insects, and your spiders and your scorpions and things which are uh, more suited to the extremely dry conditions that you find in um, in these uh, in these types of environments and then while well, you're probably wondering what a pair of monkeys are doing here well um, 
the habitat here is the uh, is the habitat of a flea. So if you think about the flea, well, the flea actually lives on the monkey, and so its habitat is the skin of the monkey and the hair of the monkey and uh, and the, the humidity that the monkey produces uh, as it sweats uh, or as it releases uh, water. Um, so. Uh, thing is that the habitat is very much from the point of view of the uh, of the animal itself okay so uh, you may also hear uh, you may also hear about uh, niche the word niche so um, a niche is uh, is a bit different to a habitat because it's it refers to the the place and the roles that the animal plays in its habitat. Okay, so uh, what type of what type of job is it doing? Okay, so we've got three uh, three examples here. Uh, we've got the bird, we've got the ant, we've got the I think this is a millipede. Um, so, for example, um, you might have a, a niche as a predator. Uh, so the bird will certainly be. Uh, looking out for insects. In this case, it looks like it's an insective insectivore. Um, may even like the idea of a millipede. Um, millipedes, if I remember correctly, are not carnivorous. I think they they eat vegetation. I may be wrong. Um, certainly, centipedes are carnivorous. Uh, ants, well, ants. Uh, it does depend on. The species of the, of the ant itself, but the point is that you have different animals occupy, occupying different places and doing different jobs, just like in a, a human society. In a way, you have um, uh, you have bank clerks, you have school teachers, you have bus drivers, you have scientists. Okay, so you've got people doing different things. Um, so it's clear that the um, uh, all of these animals in the uh, in these ecosystems are there are interrelationships between between them. So, of course, not every animal is related or inter interconnected with other with every other animal. There are, let's say, uh, there are chains and there are webs, and we will see this in, in a short while. Um, but we will have relationships which are typically uh, predator prey type of relationships um, which are often quite closely linked so the classic example is the um, is the rabbit population and the foxes uh, and the fox population so if you have a lot of rabbits um, you will get a lot of foxes because obviously the foxes are going to eat the rabbits but of course if you have a lot of rabbits at some point the grass runs out and so you will have a fall in the rabbits and that will be followed by the fo a fall in the foxes as there are not enough rabbits to eat so you have this idea of um, not only interconnections but also um, also uh, dynamic um, uh, dynamic th these interactions are dynamic okay so uh, the whole thing is it's constantly it's constantly moving it's constantly moving okay okay so this is where we uh, we might start talking about food chains and food webs uh, so um, this is a simple, uh, simple, a very simplistic uh, food chain. Uh, basically, it's who eats, who eats what or whom. Okay, um, so you, we, you might imagine a snail feeding on the pond weed in the pond, and then the turtle or a terrapin coming along and eating the snail. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Um, but this can get very very complicated very very quickly because of course it's not quite as uh, as linear as that nature hardly ever is so we end up with um, a web we end up with a network and so you can see that uh, the, the pond weed and the algae which are the the plants um, are providing food for 
well things like the the, the prawn, uh, the river prawn, or the the freshwater prawn, the carp and the fly, um, uh, and the and the uh, and the snail. So we've got uh, lots of different uh, uh, lots of different stuff which is happening here, and these in turn are being eaten by uh, larger uh, predators, um, and these are being eaten in turn by larger predators still um, and so some of these predators like for example the uh, the kingfisher and snake are um, let's say at the top of the for this this particular ecosystem they're at the top of the they're at the top of the tree if you like um, okay so uh, we have within uh, an ecosystem we have um, producers and consumers um, so the primary primary producers are the plants or the algae, um, and they are using energy from the sun. They're photosynthesizing. Um, another term which is used for this is uh, they are autotrophs. Uh, it means that they make their own food. Uh, so it says here that they are trapping carbon from the atmosphere. This is carbon dioxide. And I think what we will see as we go forward is we'll see that carbon dioxide comes up again and again. And of course, it's uh, uh, we think of it in terms of the um, uh, in terms of global warming because it's uh, it's a greenhouse gas, of course. Uh, but the CO2 is actually central to carbon is central to all of this because carbon is the element of life, and so. Uh, your plants, your photos, they're photosynthesizing, they're taking energy from the sun and they're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they are building, they're building uh, sugars which they use to make uh, their own materials. So whenever you see a tree, you're looking at lots of sugars stuck together to make cellulose, for example. Okay? Um, cyanobacteria, which you may or may not have heard of are also uh, able to photosynthesize and these are in some uh, ecosystems these become very important uh, uh, autotrophs so these are the primary producers primary because they are the fur they are the only ones which are able to make uh, make their own materials using photosynthesis um, everything else including ourselves uh, we are heterotrophs um, and that basically means that we we eat other things <laughs> other organisms um, but of course uh, eating other organisms um, we can be uh, herbivores we can be carnivores we can be omnivores um, we can be detritivores which are uh, organisms which are specialized in breaking down uh, dead or dead um, uh, dead dead organisms dead plants so this is decaying material okay um, there are very very few exceptions to uh, this uh, this thing about trapping trapping the sun's energy photosynthetically um, the exceptions that do exist are um, associated with uh, bacteria, extremophile bacteria which live under under the sea at great depths around the volcanic vents. Um, here they're using uh, chemical energy and they're using the heat from the vents. Um, it's it's very fascinating, absolutely fascinating area of uh, of um, uh, of biology or uh, biochemistry, if you like, um, because these are organisms which have never seen sunlight, um, and they use uh, they use <coughs> sulfur, these hydrogen sulfide, to uh, to run their metabolism, which is really quite a quite an extraordinary feat. Okay, so uh, so we've got predators, prey, and decomposers. Um, this is a rather spectacular um, photograph of some uh, fungi on uh, on a dead piece of wood. Um, so the primary consumers are the ones which eat the 
uh, eat the producers and the primary consumers in their turn are eaten by secondary consumers okay um, so typically these are carnivorous and they can be at any point in the chain uh, intermediate or they could be at the apex of the chain um, at the bottom let's say at the let's say outside of this chain but waiting around for dead things we have the um, we have the decomposers so we have things like the the the, the, uh, the fungi and the bacteria which are scavenging basically these are like the hyenas <laughs> of, the, of the ecosystem they're, they're getting what they can um, but they do it in such a way that they are literally breaking the molecules apart to get the energy and in doing so they play an absolutely fundamental role in getting the the nutrients the, the organic matter the organic nutrients back into uh, back into the soil and back into the uh, the system as a whole um, and it's my, the microorganisms which are which do the uh, uh, do the last part of the job um, from our point of view uh, we see this as putrefaction which is let's say not you know we say it's not not very nice but it's an absolutely essential part of the the cycle of uh, the cycle of nature uh, and it's an absolutely essential part of uh, getting all of these elements which are assembled into an organism which lives its life and then uh, and then dies um, getting these elements back into the back into the system so that they can be used again this is recycling if you like okay so um, there are different relationships in food chains of course uh, organisms may have um, in any ecos in any ecosystem may have uh, positive uh, negative or neutral effects um, uh, these interactions can have positive negative or neutral effects on, on what's called their fitness uh, their fitness is their ability to survive and their ability to reproduce so I was just just thinking about this this little plant here which is very nice um, and it's it, it hopefully uh, hopefully it won't get eaten by the mountain goat <laughs> okay uh, which of course is uh, uh, out looking for little plants to eat so um, we've got some other types of relationships which are um, not necessarily predatory though so uh, uh, we don't tend to think about herbivores as being predators but in fact they are because they're predating the uh, uh, they, they are pre sorry predating they're preying on sorry I'm getting tired um, they're preying on the uh, the plants of course well the plants can't get up and run away so it's not quite as exciting as watching uh, lions chasing gazelles but um, the plants are definitely not uh, not having a great time of it uh, but not all of the relationships are uh, dog eat dog let's say um, sometimes we have mutual mutually beneficial relationships so um, you may have something like the uh, the dung beetle here the scarab beetle which um, uses waste from herbivores which is the big herbivores the uh, the uh, the antelopes and what have you um, to create a, a food supply for its uh, for its eggs um, and it will bury this uh, bury this material and lay its eggs and the next uh, generation of dung beetles will will hatch out okay um, so this is an example of a um, uh, one animal using waste from something else to its advantage and it has no effect of course on the uh, uh, on the the gazelle or whatever it was that produced the waste in the first place um, an alternative or a, 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 another type of example is the cleaner fish which you may have come across it's it's a type of fish which is typically sort of quite long and thin and it's it's uh, stripy and it uh, it removes parasites 
and dead skin from sharks and you'll see them even eating from around the shark's mouth uh, but the shark doesn't eat them um, it's not interesting because it uh, it knows that this is a beneficial there's a benefit there's a benefit to having this uh, uh, this uh, this animal or this fish do this do this type of cleaning um, okay so we've got different types of relationships we've got predation we've got uh, relationships which are not quite as uh, not quite as serious as being eaten by someone else um, but within within an ecosystem itself uh, and within let's say the webs of interconnections between the animals um, we can actually say that some some species are more are more um, have more effect I wouldn't say are more important but they have more effect than um, others on the, 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 the maintenance of the ecosystem so um, these are these species are defined as uh, sometimes called um, keystone species uh, and they uh, have a big effect on how many other species there are and what types there are um, and in some cases their, their, their presence is absolutely vital to the survival of the ecosystem itself um, but they're not necessarily at the top of the, the pyramid so they're not necessarily the apical predators um, the example here is a, is a type of starfish which uh, feeds on mussels um, mussels are pretty prolific and if given the chance they will expand to cover whole whole areas of the seafloor um, to the detriment of other of other species so it becomes like a monoculture if you like um, the presence of these starfish which uh, are predators of the uh, of the mussels um, keeps the mussels under control such that uh, other species can actually take uh, uh, take part in uh, take part in the uh, in the resort yeah take part in the resources from this uh, from the uh, from the, the this particular ecosystem. Um, another example here is this uh, um, the sea otter, which is uh, uh, well known for. Um, using tools as well as uh, as well as uh, being being very cute um, sea otters uh, on the west coast of the US uh, protect the kelp forests kelp is a type of seaweed and um, it's a type of seaweed which attaches to a, to rocks or attaches to the seabed and then grows up with it grows up in fronds um, and the kelp uh, the kelp roots or the holdfasts as they call as they're called um, are very susceptible to um, to damage by sea urchins uh, and sea urchins are uh, also carnivorous and so sorry the, the herbivorous but they they are um, they usually carnivorous but these are not <laughs> uh, they eat the holdfasts and so the kelp can't grow properly because kelp needs to be needs to be anchored to the to the floor and in fact um, it's the uh, it's the sea otters that keep the sea urchins under control and uh, you can find photograph photographs of the uh, of the sea otters using stones to smash the sea urchins um, so this is a, a nice example of a keystone species uh, another one is uh, the wolves in um, again this is from the US the Yellowstone um, National Park um, the presence of wolves keeps the um, keeps the grazing animals the deer under control and this allows the uh, the shrubs um, the, the the woody plants and the shrubs which are within the range of the of the deer uh, the deer can eat them very easily and the deer tend to eat the um, uh, tend to eat the young shoots 
and so this actually uh, really compromises the survival of the of these plants so by controlling the deer the wolves actually give the plants chance to uh, chance to, to to grow and become uh, become trees so uh, these are two keystone examples um, sort of related but uh, perhaps even more uh, even more so uh, in terms of the um, let's say their effect on uh, on an ecosystem we have animals like beavers the beaver which is uh, of course famous for its ability to make uh, dams in rivers um, and this has a, a, a massive a huge effect on the on any ecosystem where they are present um, because by controlling the uh, the flow of water uh, particularly for example in rivers uh, they uh, are able, they they create a, a series of e of ecosystems themselves these are if you like they're artificial lakes which are made by uh, made by the beavers um, and so once the water flow becomes relatively calm you get places where other types of animals can uh, can can live and thrive. So we've got um, we've got animals like beavers, which are uh, not just let's say important species, but they're actually changing the uh, changing their environment to suit themselves. It's a it's a nice example of uh, of this. Okay, okay, so. Um, so we've got keystone species. We've got animals like beavers that are doing uh, doing their uh, doing their stuff, and then we have what are called foundation species. Um, foundation species are typically um, species they're primary producers typically, which dominate ecosystems in terms of abundance, and because they're so abundant, they have a strong influence. Um, so uh, kelp is this is this is kelp. Uh, kelp is a, a typical foundation species because it creates a type of forest environment under the sea, and this creates very special uh, very special conditions for particular uh, particular animals. Okay. Um, oops, sorry, I've just gone back there. It's my mouse. Okay, so. I'm just going to continue for a few more minutes because this is. Uh, I realise that we're now getting towards uh, getting towards half past uh, half past six. So, um, okay. So species range. So we can think about um, animals which are found in some types of animals are found in more than one uh, more than one ecosystem, uh, and perhaps the best example are the ants. Um, because ants are found everywhere, everywhere except Antarctica, which is down at the bottom here, and Greenland. And why? Well, because these are two big islands, and they've never managed to survive uh, the passage to uh, to these places. Um, but if you think about the the different types of ants that you can have, we have, well. Uh, in my garden, I think there are at least five or six different species that I've seen um, doing different things, and they just seem to ignore each other, which is fine. I don't really want uh, ant wars. Um, but if we look at these guys, this is a soldier ant from South America. Um, these are huge. They're a couple of centimeters long. Uh, you definitely don't want to uh, meet one of these. Um, Whereas this guy, this is a uh, a silver ant from Sahara Desert. So uh, these are quite they're quite small. This I have to tell you, this is the fastest creature on the planet. Um, it can run 88 centimeters in a second. 88 centimeters in a second. If you scale that up, that's um, a lot of kilometers an hour it's something like 400 okay so 
these are the fastest and they're, they're also um, if you go on YouTube you'll find some videos of these guys um, they're amazing they look like pieces of silver moving around because they have special uh, special hairs which protect them from the, 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 the heat of the Sun okay Right, so um, so we've got every, ants absolutely everywhere and doing different things, and these are leaf cutters, of course. Okay, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to stop now because it's 25 past. If anyone has any uh, any particular uh, any questions or any particular comments. So I'd, uh, I'd be quite happy to answer, try to answer any questions, whether it's about this stuff or whether it's about uh, the recycling. Well, you can turn on your microphone and make a question to Gordon. Uh, even to say if you like it, if it's... Well, yeah, that's, that's fine because it's this <laughs> doing this is like doing it in a vacuum. Okay. <laughs> Turn on the screen sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just one off. second. Just one Turn second. On. Yeah. Okay. In order that we see all the participants at once. Okay. Okay. Right. Lovely. So we got plenty of countries represented here, and maybe. Anyone want to say anything? Uh, do you like the the way of proceeding? Do you find it interesting? The way that Gordon proceeding into this very important topic. I oh, know. He is brilliant. <laughs> okay, say your name and surname and country when you are making intervention, please. Arne. Yes. Say your country. Where are you from? Where, yeah, where are you from? I'm from Lithuania. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I see. You. They are so. Yeah, it's the usual thing. Everyone is so shy. <laughs> Okay, Irina said, oh, as always, very well prepared meeting. Fully chosen information, thank you. It's a pleasure listening. Uh, okay. Well, I receive a lot of positive feedback indeed. By okay. But uh, it would be nice to hear Paloma, anything to say. You're Italian. Aren't you? Gordon understands very well Italian language. No. Okay. No. <laughs> you can try. <laughs> no question. I'm trying, but it's no, no, it's, it's, well, no, I, it's it's diff it's difficult to. Okay, we got Laura from from Italy, isn't it? One Laura. Okay. Yeah. If you want to turn on your microphone, it's me. Yes, it's yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. Where, where are you, Laura? Oh, I, I, I'm, I think I'm very close to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, in Verona. Ah, okay. okay. Where, whereabouts in Verona? Um, the, the center. Okay. Oh, okay. And, uh, j just, uh, just uh, a curiosity. Sorry. Um, the part about the fact that the dirty rubbish. Uh, uh, can be recycled. So every kind, I mean, uh, I was thinking about uh, um, the cup that uh, we use uh, mm. also at school for coffee, mm. tea, yeah. uh, and so um, yeah. those okay. can be recycled. Okay, right. So, so the th the thing is, that the thing is this that the um, so if we take if you take something like a pizza box, okay where it gets oily okay, okay. So, that, so the oil penetrates the problem the problem with the plastic cups from the the vending machines is that, is that type of plastic can't be recycled the thing with plastic is you can wash it you can clean it okay 
Uh, and in fact, you sh if you're using plastic bottles, you should, which are not for water, you should rinse them before you put them in the bin, uh, okay. in the, the, the recycling bin. Um, but the problem for the plastic cups from the vending machines is that you c it's a type of plastic which you can't recycle. Okay. 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 So that Thank you. Bit. That was the big thing there. <laughs> okay. okay, but I was a bit too worried. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, it's okay. It's okay. So, Daiva, you look uh, very Lithuanian. Daiva is a very Lithuanian name. Yeah, I'm from Lithuania. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, uh, do you find interesting this kind of. Oh, yeah, approach? I do. Um, it's it's very it's very uh, useful to know all the information and uh, myself is recycling only I guess for four years. Mm -hmm. I wasn't love so much nature before as I do right now at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And do you do you do you, do you live in a city or do you uh, live in a village? Small city. Small city. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gordon has never been in Lithuania. He doesn't know that 99% is countryside, flatland. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, yeah, northern, northern. Uh, very beautiful, very beautiful yeah. country. Yeah, it's Which nice. part of Lithuania are you from? Uh, Mariampole. Oh, Mariampole, ah, I know. Oh, you do? <laughs> yes. That's I've nice. been traveling around Lithuania many, many times. Many years. All right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Do you remember Thai Ash uh, Bard Festival? Thai Ash, it's me. It was, uh, well, some years ago I was participating as a musician there. Uh, lovely. So we got Irena. Where are you from, Irena? Ling Hello. Hello, um, I'm from Lithuania too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> And um, I'm from Shilale, maybe you know it in the west um, part of Lithuania. Yes. And I live in, not in a city, I live near the city in a village. Mm -hmm. So we've got some, just a few neighbors, so. Um, Lovely. A lot of nature. Yeah. Calm, animal. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, really good, uh, it's really interesting because I'm an English teacher and. Um, when I got the uh, opportunity to listen, because I'm not uh, very good at um, at these, uh, um, how to say, nature or or, or recycling uh, things, because I'm, I'm a language teacher. Just uh, I wondered maybe I will get something interesting and maybe it will be useful for me, for my students, and maybe for. Well, yeah. The video will be available for everyone on the platform, so you can have your students having a look and make comments and so on. Uh, if you can still a moment to you, I posted in the chat uh, two links. One, our platform on Viber, and if you want to join it, there will be a network of people and teachers from all over the world there. And the second one is the website of the European Project School Plastic Free Movement. And please, please register, and you will find the links in the chat. If you have any problem to register your presence, just write me, and uh, you'll find I write my email here. You can write me, and I will uh, uh, add your presence for today. That's practical things. Because what we are doing here is, is within a European Erasmus Plus project, uh, creativity free policy reform. It's school plastic free movement. So we will come and invite all the teachers to online meeting with us and decide together what to do, what we can do for the environment in every country, from denouncing what we see to substitute plastic <laughs> from anything you can have in mind. Okay. And uh, okay, Gordon, I thank you so much as usual. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, thank, you, thank, you for, thank you for your patience, because I, I, don't, I don't know what it's like to listen to me for two hours. So. <laughs> it's wonderful. I just, uh, I just hope, it's, I just hope it's, uh, it's not too boring. Okay, but so thank, yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gordon, remember... Sorry? 
Hello? Okay. Someone is speaking to telephone. This is Maria yeah. Jose. Okay. And uh, Gordon, if you can uh, send to me the uh, PowerPoint they've been showing, I will upload, upload all of them as well, if you don't mind. We can transform in PDF and upload on the website, if you don't okay. mind. If you mind. Can do. Okay. okay. In case you want to use them for your lessons uh, in classrooms and so on, you have some material ready made. And, uh, okay, Gordon, your magic as usual. And if you want an opinion, ask to Cecilia. Cecilia, she is from Varese, northern part of Italy. She's collaborating with the network. She's working with us. And she said, she is always great. <laughs> You're fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. You all right. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Have a nice evening to all of you. Okay. Right. Bye. 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 Thank you for your participation.